the consonance and dissonance of international school music teaching today. We all have a story. Our stories are reflections of our experience and our stories shape our identity. Our stories are the essence of who we are. They provide the lens with which we see the world. Stories inform our beliefs, our biases, and our actions. This morning, I'm going to draw on the collective stories of international school music teachers from around the world. In doing so, I want you to reflect on your own story. What is your journey to becoming an international school music educator? How has your experience of music throughout your life shaped who you are and how you teach music today? What is your musical story and how does this shape your identity? Some stories will resonate with you and others won't. But that's just the nature of stories. I want you to position yourself within and around some of these stories and use them to launch you into the conference this weekend with renewed clarity. So, I'll start with some of my story. And as I tell my story, use it to trigger your own reflections. Let your mind wander, let your thoughts percolate. And oddly enough, my story starts here, in the Netherlands. My parents were both Dutch immigrants to Sydney, Australia, moving with their families in the mid-60s as part of the post-World War II migration wave out of Europe. So, my upbringing as an Australian child was layered with connections to my Dutch heritage. We had Dutch embroidery hanging on the walls, we cheered for Holland in the Football World Cup, no one knew how to pronounce my surname, and of course, I grew into a tall, fair-haired teenager. Yes, that's me. My parents spoke Dutch with their siblings and my grandparents, but I never learnt the language. In those days in Australia, being Dutch made you an outcast and a target for discrimination. My parents were busily working away at not being Dutch at every opportunity. They renounced their Dutch citizenship, became Australian nationals, and never really entertained the idea of travelling back to Holland. But little did they know that globalisation and Western liberalism would have a different agenda. By the time I was that fair-haired teenager, I was firmly fixed on the idea of travelling to Holland. In fact, like most of my friends, I was pretty keen on travelling the whole world. Australia was a long way from everything, so travel was the key to unlocking cultural understanding and global experience. Now, peppered throughout my childhood was music. My grandfather was a church organist, pianist and choir conductor, and my dad is a pianist and bass player. I distinctly remember the pitter-patter of fingers on the electric keyboard every night when dad came home from work. Headphones on and body and mind fully immersed, music was his escape after a long day in the office. I reluctantly sang in the church choir, but my three brothers and I happily sang our favourite songs together in the car and learnt how to harmonise with each other. Music was there, but my real love was another favourite Dutch pastime, football aka soccer. As young as I can remember, I was tearing around the field after a ball. I trained most days and was selected for representative teams. But at 16, it all fell apart. After a heavy challenge from an opponent, I snapped my anterior cruciate ligament, the main piece of the puzzle that holds your knee together. It hurt a lot, and I even tried looking for photos from that period. Interestingly, there were none. The injury also meant a major operation and no football for nine months. Luckily, mum had encouraged me to pick up the bass guitar a couple of years earlier. She'd suggested I try another hobby, that I liked music and that I might find a useful outlet in it, like my father. I'd picked up the bass, dad called some notes over his shoulder from the piano and I was off and running. It was a special day when my grandfather, dad, and I played a gig together. And you can tell we don't take our photos too seriously either. So, in my sedentary post-operation state, I poured my heart into the bass. Seven years later, I had finished a double degree in music and education. In those seven years, I also worked as a professional session bass player, toured with a band in the US, 
opened my own music school, played in orchestras and sang in choirs. I liked performing, but I loved teaching. I still enjoyed football, but my profession and future would be in music education. By this point, the travel bug was biting hard. After teaching music in an Australian state school for a couple of years, my wife Mika, who is also a music teacher, saw a job advertised in Buenos Aires, Argentina. She was offered the job, and it didn't take much convincing for either of us to sell everything, pack up, and head to Argentina. For three years, we ran the music department together, learned to speak Spanish, and acquired a love for the South American tea called mate. We became deeply connected to the culture, the people, and the lifestyle. Argentina was now part of our identity, but unfortunately, the total collapse of the economy meant we needed to move on. So Malaysia, in all its tropical glory, would be our new home. This time, I was head of music and Mika switched to visual arts. We lived and worked there for eight years and had the most amazing time. It feels like it was a lifetime. In 11 years as international school teachers, we traveled 46 countries. We climbed mountains, dived secluded reefs, ate in countless markets, and witnessed ways of life that we never knew existed. As a music educator... Those 11 years also completely changed me. I went from an early career middle school general music teacher with a background in contemporary rock and pop music to a confident, he's been here for ages kind of guy at an established international school where I would happily do things like lead a combined 150-piece orchestra and choir. The learning curve was immense, the expectations high, but the outcomes were life-changing. Teaching music in that international school in Malaysia became my thing. Malaysia was home, lifelong friendships were forged, and the future looked bright. And then, that thing we all now know as COVID-19 happened. To some of us, it kind of seems like a blur now, a forgotten couple of years, a hazy period of time where certainty was lost and reality shifted. For some of us, it was a time of explosive creativity renewed headspace and innovation. For others, it was complete despair and loss of identity and purpose. The first realization of teaching music online during COVID was, of course, understanding that we couldn't sing, move or play instruments together in real time. So we basically had to start from scratch, didn't we? We had to write new programs, learn new ways of doing things, and basically deconstruct what it meant to be a music teacher. In-person ensemble rehearsals, singing together, jamming and concerts with large audiences took a back seat. And body percussion, Google Classroom, virtual choirs and online recitals became the norm. It was a massive change. For me, like many other international school music educators at the time, it also meant a shift in trajectory. I'd been thinking about the idea of doing a PhD looking at music education in international schools for some time. I'd even made a start on it in 2019, but had to stop after one semester due to the demands of my role at school. But the idea kept gnawing at me, and COVID actually gave me the time to think more clearly about it. Some health issues in my immediate family back in Australia was the final straw. It was time to make a move, and crack on with a PhD. So, in July 2021, we packed up life in Malaysia, spent two weeks in quarantine in Sydney, and I've been exploring the world of international school music education ever since. As part of this process, I've been interviewing international school music teachers from around the world via the Music Teachers in International Schools podcast. The podcast aims to take a deep dive into the unique world of international school music teaching, to build connection and share knowledge. It builds on the vision of organizations such as AMI to bring international school music teachers together, to learn from each other and build bridges between our little music department islands. Through lots of reading and writing, the podcast interviews and formal interviews for my PhD, I've been building a picture of the complex international school music education world that all of us here call home. 
This picture is shaped by two words that are very familiar to most of us here, consonance and dissonance. And we're going to parallel the musical meaning of these two words with their social meanings. Now, often when I present this idea, I need to wade through the musical context of these two words. So it's nice to be in a room full of music educators where I can shortcut a couple of things. The main thing I do want to make clear, though, is that Western scholars of music generally agree that consonance and dissonance are subjective terms. That is, we interpret whether a musical idea is consonant or dissonant based on our prior experience with music. For a Western musician, dissonance is usually thought of as the rough beating of two frequencies inside the ear to cause a feeling of unpleasantness. And consonance is basically the opposite, smoothness and pleasantness. And this subjectivity is best shown by how musicians from non-Western backgrounds describe their music. For example, gamelan musicians from Indonesia and Malaysia tune their instruments to intentionally create that beating roughness, making what they call lively and full music. Similar interpretations can be found in Middle Eastern, North Indian, and Bosnian musical cultures. So, as we explore the topic of teaching music in an international school today, let's keep this subjectivity in mind. One person's dissonance might be another's consonance, and vice versa. And in the words of the ARMY founders, Dick and Georgia Bassett, in the international school music education world, there can be many right ways to do things. So here we are, all together a room full of international school music teachers. We all have a story that brought us to this conference. Some of our stories will be similar in ways, and many of our motivations and personal philosophies will align. Some of us are keen travelers and adventurers. Some of us are running away from things in our home countries. Some of us are tapping into new opportunities for professional growth or financial security. But what exactly does being an international school music teacher mean? Who are we and how did we all get here? To get us thinking a little more deeply about this, think to yourself for a minute. In your understanding, what is an international school? Tricky, isn't it? We're at the Association for Music in International Schools Music Educators Conference Yet it's often quite hard to define what an international school actually is today. And this is our first potential dissonance. International schools generally exist as a result of three influences. Colonization, post-World War II expansion of multinational organizations, and the more recent impacts of globalization. In the 19th and early 20th centuries, International schools began as satellite versions of elite English schools to serve the children of colonial administrators. They often replicated the curriculum and ethos of these English schools, but many offered education to local elites as well. There were also a few schools that surfaced on the back of new waves of international collaboration, such as the International School of Geneva and the Yokohama International School, which both opened in 1924. As businesses from dominant Western nations pursued economic interests abroad after World War II, more schools popped up to cater to new international workers and their families. For example, there are many international schools that exist today that were originally created to support the expanding oil, gas and mining industries of the 70s, 80s and 90s. And with improvements in technology came improvements in communication and by the 1980s and 90s, the governments of the UK, the US, Canada and Australia decided that education would become a commodity on global markets. New international schools were set up around the world by foreigners and locals, and a new international education sector was born. According to organisations like ISC Research, there are now over 13,000 international schools in the world. There are, of course, various opinions and definitions of what an international school is today. But the most useful definition I've found so far is from the book International Schooling, The Teacher's Guide by Dr. Denry Mackin and Dr. Stephen Whitehead. They suggest that 
An international school is one which provides a private, fee-paying education undertaken in schools declaring themselves international, attended by full-time students who study a curriculum that is not the national curriculum of the country in which the school is geographically located. Today, many international schools promote an international curriculum, like the IB or Cambridge International, as a, a key selling point. Others point to the idea of having lots of nationalities represented on campus. Yet others highlight international mindedness or global citizenship as part of their offer. Others simply put the word international in their name for competitive advantage in the private schooling market. International schools can be confusing entities and potential dissonances like this remind us of our unique place as teachers in international schools. They challenge us to think deeply about our values, our biases and our perceptions. They inspire us to be open-minded and reflective. The dissonance once again pulls on our emotions, that rough beating in our ears, and makes us think, what does working in an international school actually mean to me? And most importantly, how does music education fit into all of this? Most of us would agree that being a music educator in an international school is a truly fulfilling pathway and profession. From my podcast interviews with music teachers from international schools around the world, I've found five ideas that seem to come up time and time again. Number one, most, if not all, international schools offer a music program. Considering that in many Western public education systems, music education provision is on a downward trajectory, international schools seem to be maintaining or even increasing provision. Why is this? Well, it seems to be a combination of money and freedom. International schools have the freedom to charge a fee for education and can then use that revenue to invest in holistic education programs. This is fueled by a global education market that views holistic education as essential to 21st century learning. International schools are rarely constrained by local education policies, so they can put money where they want. And more often than not, this includes sufficient money for some music things. Most international schools seem to have ample resources and staffing for music, and some international schools have truly mind-blowing facilities and resources. Put it this way, the facilities and resources in my last school in Malaysia were the envy of most of my music education friends back in Australia. Number two. An international school music program is often the face of the school. That's right. We are pseudo-marketers, aren't we? Our music programs are splashed across websites and school social media. We have regular meetings with the school admin or even, as is more commonly the way these days, with the school marketing team. We discuss strategy, branding, poster designs and color schemes. We write articles and record videos for the school to show off what we do. It takes a lot of effort and time, but we also know that we are constantly needing to sell our subject. Why? Because we need to keep our numbers up in our IB classes and in our band programs, and we are battling against a multitude of other courses and events that are offered to our students. Plus, it can be argued that we are up against the dominant economic perspective in society known as human capital theory. This idea suggests to our students and their parents that subjects should be chosen according to how much potential value they bring to the economy. That's it. If it doesn't make the big bucks, then don't do it. Students and parents are fixated on their exam results, choice of university and subsequent financial and social capital that these may bring. So, we go home and start finding the numbers on how much the arts contribute to the economy And we send an email to the principal to ask for a meeting to look at what the school can do to increase uptake for DP music or our band program. The next day, the school principal replies to our email saying, Yes, sure, let's do it. How is next Wednesday at 10am? Oh, and hey, while I've got you, uh, we have a special function next week and we want to impress our guests. Could you pull together a couple of hours of music, please? Thanks in advance. And you think... Okay, sure. Hang on, what do you mean thanks in advance? I haven't even agreed yet. Oh, I get it. It's Yeah, it's not a question. 
As much as the dissonance swells in us from this common little scenario, we recognize the opportunity for our students to shine and call an extra rehearsal or two to pull it together. We're exhausted, but our students love it. The principal loves it, and we build another small Lego block of cultural capital in our school. You see, we know that's what music education does for an international school. It's a culture builder. It draws people together, it entertains, it provides artistic moments that resonate with the senses and emotions of both performer and audience. It builds important shared memories for the community. Think back to your most recent student performance. What were the emotions that you saw in the room? From the audience, you may have seen a mixture of distraction as parents were texting madly on their phones mid-performance. But you might have also seen what I like to call concerned concentration. That look of an audience member that is connected to a musical moment, frozen in time, deeply engaged by the expression of the performer or performers. You may have also seen happiness, pride, joy, contentment, introspection, and yes, possibly the blank expression coming from the eyeless face and gaping mouth of a grandfather who is way past his bedtime. Consonance and Dissonance What a tricky position it is to be the face of the school sometimes. Yet, music is often the face of the school because it is arguably one of the only subjects that truly can be. A human face expresses myriad things. And like a human face, music is one of the only other things that can channel expression so vividly. Regardless of how big our DP classes are or how many students we have in the band program, we know we are doing something greater than numbers can measure. 3. Teaching music in an international school can often be an isolating experience. Almost all of my podcast guests have mentioned this idea, and usually it comes in two forms. The first form is, of course, geographic isolation. I recently interviewed Alison Armstrong. If you don't know her, please do look her up on Twitter. Alison has just moved to Tashkent International School in Uzbekistan, and as you can imagine, There are only a few international schools in Tashkent. When you are living and working in a place like Tashkent or Phnom Penh or Santo Domingo, it can be tricky to build networks. You don't have the state, district or county education system bringing you together with other music teachers. If you're lucky, you might have an organization like Ami to help, but otherwise you end up grinding along on your own, grabbing ideas and resources from wherever you can. The other form of isolation we experience is curricular isolation. Although most international schools offer music as a subject, it can still often be seen as an other or extra subject. School leaders without a background in music might have no idea how to support the development of pedagogy and content for music education, so they just simply leave the music teacher alone. Again, consonance and dissonance. The isolation can mean that the music teacher can plow on, be creative and innovative, and draw on influences from literally all over the world to build an amazing curriculum. But sometimes, we'd love to be given the same kind of attention and support as other subjects, right? So what about you? Have you experienced either of these forms of isolation? Maybe a bit of dissonance for some of us as we think this through. Number four. International schools are pioneering new ideas in music education pedagogy. Okay, let's see if we can cultivate some serious consonants now. Through my interviews and interactions in the international school music education space, I have noticed two exciting patterns. Number one, international school music teachers are leading the way in providing culturally diverse music education experiences for students. And two, They are at the forefront of engaging with innovations in music technology. Let's see if this translates across to all of us here today. Raise your hand if you include some kind of culturally diverse music education experience in your curriculum. This could be an orchestra piece from a non-Western composer or some West African drumming, etc., etc. Okay, raise your hand if you include some kind of tablet or computer-based music learning in your curriculum. International schools are wonderful sites for exploring culture through music. Our increasingly globalized world often tries to homogenize us into one unified identity. But music educators tend to resist this force. 
We know that all cultures use music to express ideas, and as international school music teachers, we recognize our special place in celebrating the uniqueness of different cultures. We sing, move, and play instruments from all over the world. We spend time earnestly learning about the social and cultural context to communicate these distinct musical ideas. We bring in experts and cultural bearers to bring even more depth to these experiences. Our students' minds expand and they are transported somewhere new. Music making is always evolving. Today, our students make music in ways that most of us never thought would be possible. Apps, trigger pads, MIDI sampling, and looping are normal elements of a professional musician's toolkit today. International school music teachers appear to be leading the way with pushing the boundaries when using music tech with their students. We are often given the freedom to try new things and can break away from tradition. So we go for it. My podcast guests regularly mention new crazy ideas they are working on, or they speak about a student that is doing something amazing. Last week, I spoke to a teacher at an international school in Singapore who has a year 10 student who is a DJ and is massive on YouTube. This is our community. These are our students. Number five, the impact of COVID on international school music programs. It would be a remiss of me not to mention this common thread through all of my recent conversations. It's not something I want to dwell on today, but I do want to acknowledge the reality that it presented us. I'm sure many of you had similar experiences. For my music department, COVID was completely deflating and soul-destroying. In Malaysia, we had roughly 12 months of online learning in the space of one and a half years. In a school that would run upwards of 30 music events a year, including two musicals, multiple concerts, recitals, and more, plus national and international performance tours, COVID created a massive chasm. Combined with the way that online learning changed the whole experience of doing music, my team was completely shell-shocked. Sense of purpose was lost, and any kind of department vision was destroyed. As waves of COVID came and went, we tried to plan events, only to have them cancelled soon after. You just couldn't plan anything. Of course, we learnt how to make sourdough and we got good at staying positive with memes like this, but the impact on our music programs was huge. But we also learnt some things, didn't we? We found new pieces of software, new websites and created new systems. Music exams from the ABRSM and RSL Awards moved online. Many of us got much better at recording and editing video and audio. Our students joined virtual choirs and we had them produce and compose music in unique ways. Teachers also started sharing more. Facebook groups were filled with questions from bewildered music teachers and answers to those questions flowed freely. These groups became important sources of solidarity and support. It was a tough period, but we were not alone. And many of these COVID ideas became normal parts of how we do things today. We happily jump on a Zoom or Teams or Meets call to conduct our meetings if need be. We return to those Facebook groups to ask questions and seek new ideas. We have new ways of assessing our students and our integration of music tech into the curriculum has improved. Many of us have returned back to some of our pre-COVID systems, but small shifts have happened. What ideas have you kept from teaching music during COVID restrictions? Make sure you share them this weekend. In 2022, things have looked much more optimistic for many international school music teachers. My podcast guests have all spoken about a renewed sense of optimism this academic year. Simon Green, head of secondary music at Bangkok Prep School in Thailand, summed it up well here. It feels almost new. And for a teacher, for something to feel new is is it doesn't it doesn't always happen. You know, the year comes around again, another Christmas concert on the way, another spring. Co- so there, it's a very sort of cyclical kind of existence. Uh, but things do feel very new again. You know, this sort of renewal. Uh, so just just everybody, I think, feeling uh, feeling like they can perform again together and and listen and come together and listen to those performances rather than having to do it all alone on a screen. That That's really the most exciting thing. 
Rehearsals, concerts, trips and festivals are all back in most countries. For some of us, it's almost kind of overwhelming though, right? It's a bit of a shock to the system. One of my colleagues, Li Chi Ong, who is currently working in Shanghai, China, and is still battling some COVID restrictions, has been told that her school will be hosting a student orchestra festival for 10 schools in the city next March. The problem is, she's new to her school, plus the school was unable to hire the two other required music teachers for this academic year. She's basically on her own and in the deep end. She will pull the event together with the support of school admin, but it's going to be tough. Of course, she is rebuilding her orchestra program after COVID too. Her approach? Focus on building the foundation. Lee is taking small steps each day to rebuild the program at her school. Her mantra is communication, compassion, and clarity. Rebuilding takes time, and just like any building, the time taken to secure the foundation is the most important thing. She is making her elementary program the focus first. She recognizes that building an orchestra program takes time. Now, if she can get her grade five and six students going, then after a couple of years, it will filter into secondary. It has also been super important for her to clearly articulate this to her principal. She has dared to start looking ahead and has created vision for what the next few years will look like to help kickstart the orchestra again. What are some of your strategies for rebuilding your programs after COVID? Take this weekend to seek advice and share some success you've had with your fellow delegates. So, amongst all of this consonance and dissonance, our stories will keep on guiding us. It also leaves us with the questions, what is ahead for international school music teachers? What challenges will we face next? How will we maintain our programs? How will we continue to react to the constant changes in the way music is experienced in society? To help make sense of all of this, I like to ask a particular question to most of my podcast guests. The question is designed to get my guests really thinking, to explore their unique role, to understand their place, to think about their future, their future story. The question sounds simple, but it's layered with nuance. The question is, what makes a good international school music teacher? And here are some of the responses. What do you think, from your experience so far, makes a good international school music teacher? Gosh, that is such a good question. Letting your inhibitions go and being bold. Become adept, proficient, masterful at some form of technology. I think you have to go in and be prepared to relearn a lot of stuff. Um, Should be more open-minded and be more accepting of other cultures. A curator of musical experiences for my students, a librarian of musical experiences. To throw themselves into those learning situations and not worry about being wrong. Find a way to use your instrument, your skill, whether it's guitar, singing, whatever um, outside of the classroom in a band or online or on YouTube something flexibility and understanding Um, one of the things we see a lot in international schools is that you have children who are coming from all different backgrounds it's someone who taps into also the local hire at the school you've got to be prepared to work hard right you know it's work hard play hard being aware of the changes that are happening around the world. What is happening internationally in music? If we are saying it's an international curriculum, how much international mindedness are we bringing in? To have fun with the kids and with your colleagues uh, and wherever you are in the world. Definitely finding finding experts in your community um, to allow students to build these musical communities. They should always be planning for growth. Become adept or proficient at mapping sort of that garden path where you show each of the activities. Determination and throwing one's inhibitions right out the door. That is how we develop respect for other cultures, is what I think. Being more accepting of the changes that happen. Every school is different, every class is different even just because of, of, of the mix. And I know that's normal in all teaching, but I think it's particularly so in international teaching. Because every music teacher has a different slant on where their strengths and weaknesses are. And music can be a great medicine, you know, it, we just need to double the dose.
Thank you for what you are all doing to impact the lives of the young musicians in your care. I hope this conference becomes a pivotal part of your story as an international school music educator. Thank you.